Okay, so now we're recording. We're going to go over number 22 from the trig review. And then any other questions that might pop up. Number 22 is an equation where we're going to have to make a replacement such that I can solve for x in this case. And I believe the directions have two different things here. We're, we want to solve this over 0 to 360. And then part B was the same thing, just repeating your answers in radians, though. So over 0 to 2 pi. Good morning to those of you just joining us. First thing we're going to go over is number 22 here. So I think the big hint for this one is to change cosecant into the function 1 over sine x. So remembering that that's the reciprocal of the function sine will help you in this case, because then what you can do is if you multiply both sides by sine x, over here, you're gonna get those to cancel to just leave you with one. And then over here, two sine times sine is two sine squared x. And that is probably one of the tougher parts to get this one started. Just remembering just a little bit of the algebra, make that replacement, multiply both sides by sine. But then if you divide the two over to get sine squared alone, you now get sine squared equals a half. All right, I, I, I'll keep going if you want me to. Does anyone want me to keep going with this one? Or we're feeling confident now that we see where we're at. You can just type into the chat if you want me to keep going. Otherwise, I'll stop here for 22. Okay, so there is a request to keep going. And yeah, there is actually a tricky step in my opinion coming up because when you take the square root of both sides to get rid of squaring this function, now we get sine x isolated. But what I notice even for some of the people who've already turned in this assignment a little bit early, when you take the square root of both sides, you can't forget about good old plus or minus. And that's a common thing to forget. You know, I'm sure at one point in my life, I forgot to write a plus or minus, but when you take the square root of both sides, it's then plus or minus. How would I expect you to list the square root of a half? Well, you can take the square root of the top and then the square root of the bottom. The square root of the top is just one and then the bottom would have to stay radical two. And I guess my hint for this one is I know that this rationalizes to become radical two over two, but I would encourage you to not do that because what you now have to do is you have to draw triangles in the appropriate quadrants label them with these values, right? Because sine is opposite over hypotenuse. You'll hopefully determine the reference angle more easily if you leave it unrationalized like this. So is this okay as a stopping place now that we've gotten to this step, we think? Okay, perfect. Yeah, and for this one, I mean, plus or minus, we're, we're gonna get four different answers because my all-star trig class would tell me that sine's positive in these two, but we also want to know where sine's negative. So you're going to get four answers to that one. I think I've gotten you to a pretty good place with 22, but yeah, probably a little bit tough to get that one started. Just be aware of the plus or minus. And then the other thing is we see something like this and we automatically, I think, want to rationalize it. In this scenario, I think it's easiest to leave it like that and label the sides of the triangle with those values, okay? All right, very good question to get us started. What else can I help with this morning? Could you, could you go over um, how to calculate start and end points for the trig functions? Yeah, do you want me to do the one that's specifically on here, Greg, or just in general? Um, yeah, you can do the one that's on here, on the okay. sheet. Yeah, so if I take a look at something like, I'll look at number uh, 18. So for number 18, we have y equals negative 2 cos x plus pi over 4 minus 3. Okay. Um, if you want to calculate what are called the start points and the end points. What we have to think about for this example is that, first of all, because of the negative you have in front of the amplitude, the parent function is going to be an upside down cos curve. It's going to look like this. So if you look at where the start and the end happen, the start and the end 
are at the lowest point in the range of this function. So before I can even list the start point and the end point, it, at some point in this process, I prompt you to find the range. So how do we get the range? Well, for the parent function, for any sine or cosine graph, it's negative one to one. And that's kind of what I've, I've sketched up here. But then the two things that would affect the y values are the amplitude change. So we're going to multiply this by two. Now we're from negative two to two. And then if you look at the vertical shift at the end, moving this down three, subtracting three from both endpoints, get you a final range that goes from negative five to negative one. So what I now know is that these start and end points for an upside down coast curve occur at the lowest value in the range, which happens to be negative five. So that's the y values for the start and the end. How do I find the start point? The start x coordinate is going to be, did I shift this graph left or right at all? So was there a phase shift? And according to this um, equation, yes, there was a phase shift to the left, pi over four. So if I'm only sketching one cycle of this graph, where, I, where I would expect you to start that one cycle would be the coordinate negative pi over four, comma negative five. So your start is always gonna be essentially whatever the phase shift is. And then how do I figure out where the end value is? To get to the end, you have to add on the period because the period is how long it takes to complete one cycle. Now what's different about this one as compared to number 17 is that this one doesn't have a frequency that you have to factor out. The frequency is still one, right? It's not like the frequency is zero, that would be impossible. But with the frequency of one, what that means is that the period in this example is just two pi because the period's two pi divided by the frequency. So if you add on two pi, I would just make maybe a quick de uh, common denominator there, right? Two pi is the same thing as eight pi over four. It appears that the graph is gonna end at seven pi over four comma negative five. So that's how I figure out start and end points. If this was not upside down cos and it was just a normal looking cos, then these y values would have been at the highest point in the range, which is negative one. And one quick note is, if it was a sine function instead of a cosine function, the start and end y values are on the midline. So in other words, whatever the vertical shift is, wherever that wrap line is, or I think I've referred to it as the midline as well, if this was a sine function, these actually would have been negative three each. Because for a sine parent function, you'll notice that the start and the end are right on that vertical shift piece, okay? So a lot of things to pay attention to as far as that goes, but yeah, starting end points, they're, they're pretty important so I can get a good um, establishment for what one cycle looks like. But that's, I think, probably one of the trickier things to remember how to establish based on, this is what we were doing just before we went out. We were like just almost finished with trig graphing and then all of a sudden we couldn't go to school anymore. So. That's what we were finishing at that time. All right, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that one. Any other trig questions I can help out with this morning? We're feeling pretty good otherwise, trig-wise here. Oops, sorry guys, I did not mean to leave the meeting. <laughs> I'm back though. All right, Michaela's a good question. She said, are you posting the review today or tomorrow? I think is Michaela's question. 
Um, I plan on posting that probably actually right after we're done with today's call. So you guys can get started on that final review as soon as, um, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes from now. Yeah, because I know some of you are already done with the trig review. So if you're finished with the trig review, if you've, you've submitted that and you want to get a jump start on the last review, then I will post that for you. All right. That's a good question. Can I ask, um, for those of you that are here, did you get or receive, if you're taking pre-calc honors next year, did you get an email about the summer homework assignment already? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, I just wanted to make sure that that was the case because I was hoping that they would find a way to get that info to you. But if you have any questions about that assignment, you can let me know or your teachers next year. Your teachers next year, if it, I think it probably said in the email, it's probably going to be Mr. Martin or Mr. Kluse. Did it say that as well? Like the, you have one of those two teachers next year? Okay. So if you have questions about that assignment, you can contact them, but feel free to contact me as well. You know, I taught that course, I don't know, as recently as just a few years ago. So I remember giving that summer homework assignment. And if you have something that you're like, hey, you know, Mr. All, can you clarify this for me quickly? I'd be happy to do that if needed. But otherwise, you could also reach out to them if you have questions too. So, all right, perfect. Um, you sure there's nothing else math-wise I can help you with you today, whether it's trig-related or something else? I had a feeling this would be a quick meeting, which is which is fine by me. Maybe some of you are going to head back to bed after this, and that's totally fine, too. The one thing I'll kind of wrap up with is, it, you know, I said in my email that you've now gotten two copies of, I think, that on Thursday is going to be our last Google Meet of the year. So I'm hoping that all of you can attend. And um, we are going to separate it to first period and ninth period just so that, you know, we can try and maybe each go around, say a final quick goodbye, talk about maybe some things we're looking forward to this summer. Hopefully plans haven't been canceled or affected too much, but just kind of a quick check-in with everybody, see if you want to ask me anything about the final review that's due Friday. And that's pretty much it. So save the date for Thursday morning. I think first period I said was 9 a.m. and then ninth period would be 10 a.m. to follow. So, all right. All right, if you guys have any questions, I'm definitely willing to stick around for a little while longer. Otherwise, if you think you're good, that's it for today. Goodbye, see you, Michaela. I'm going to stop recording. You're welcome. Thanks, Katie. See you, Greg. Thanks.